Chapter 7 What happened to Anne? Noah asked as he grabbed an apple. Anne had been gone for a little over a week. Michael still felt himself wandering the house searching for her. He was bored and heartsick. Noah! El hissed and gave him a warning look before glancing guiltily at Michael. What? She was all gung-ho to help and now she's disappeared. Did you guys have an argument or something? He bit into the apple with a crunch. An argument Michael could understand. Anne had just decided that she wasn't happy here, wasn't happy with him. Michael didn't want to talk about it. He didn't know what to do. What he did know is that he wanted Anne to be happy, so if she needed to be somewhere else to be happy, then he wouldn't stand in her way as much as he might want to. He went to the deck, leaving the door open behind him. Anne need to take care of some personal things, El said to Noah. Michael could hear her just barely from where he stood. He knew that El and Anne were friends. She probably knew what was going on with Anne, but he didn't know if he could find a way to ask her. Instead, he decided to eavesdrop shamelessly. Is she coming back? I don't think so. She wants different things. Different things? Like what? Anne always struck me as the type to get what she wants. Michael could imagine El giving Noah an exasperated look. Noah was brilliant at the science of his job, but when it came to the nuances of people, he was terrible. Worse than Michael, and that was saying something. She's going on a date tonight with George Stapleton. Michael felt like he'd been punched in the stomach. He leaned back against the siding of the house, his Anne dating someone else. If she wanted to date someone so badly to try to get past Max, she could have dated him. Then again, he was Max's brother. Maybe it was too painful for her. Isn't that the guy who owns the chain of dentist clinics? He's always on television with the bad haircut, Noah asked. He and Anne hit it off at the golf tournament. Elle didn't sound very happy for her friend. I guess she's moving on. Michael didn't want her to move on, whatever that meant. He wanted her back. He swallowed thickly and wondered what he could do about it. Could Anne be happy with this guy? She said she wasn't happy here with him. He wondered what he could do to make her happy. The only thing he could think to do was ask her. Ask her. He almost gave a bitter laugh but stopped himself. He didn't want Noah or Elle to know that he'd been able to hear them. He'd have to try to make the effort. He'd go to Anne and ask her what he could do to make her happy. He'd make her understand that he wanted to try. He couldn't imagine life without her. The last few days without her had been horrible, lonely. He pushed away from the house and decided to take a walk and look at the sailboat. He would check the lines and make sure it was secure. It felt like it was going to storm. While he was looking the boat over, maybe his mind would come up with a solution of how he was going to get to Anne's apartment and communicate effectively enough to bring her back. He didn't want Elle and Noah's help with this. If it went sour, he would like to lick his wounds in private rather than see him pity him even more. An hour later, he cleaned the entire boat methodically. He was finishing by polishing up some of the chrome detailing when Noah came aboard. You still have the boat? He ran a hand down the side of a rolled-up sail before having a seat. She must be thirty years old. Thirty-five next week. He'd gotten it three weeks after his fifteenth birthday to replace the smaller one he'd grown up with. Remember when we used to take it out? I'd never been so sick. Noah laughed, remembering. Noah was a horrible sailor. A rowboat on calm waters was the most he could handle. Michael nodded in agreement. Good memories, Noah reminisced. I don't think it helped that Max kept trying to kill us every time we let him try his hand at the wheel. Max had been reckless. He was young back then and always pushing everything to the limit. He lived a charmed life, never being seriously hurt despite the crazy stunts he had pulled. More than once he'd caused Michael a fright. Finally, Max had settled and matured. Paget was the final piece of Max's puzzle. Michael was glad for his youngest brother. Remember when he capsized this boat? Dad was so mad he threatened to sell it. He threatened, but he couldn't sell what he didn't own. Michael had made sure the boat was in his name. Even then he'd understood his father. Thankfully, he and Mum were on that cruise for a couple more months, and he wouldn't have to deal with them until they came back. He loved Mum, 
He just didn't want to be smothered by her right now. Dad? Dad wouldn't understand. Noel reached out and gave a shoulder squeeze. It will be okay, Michael. I know this thing with Anne is hard, but you'll get through it. He wouldn't have to get through it. He had a plan. Admittedly, it wasn't a great plan, but it was all he had, and he was going to try. He wasn't going to just stand by and let her walk away. Not his Anne. He nodded to Noel and put away the rag and cleaner. The boat was as good as it got these days. He supposed most people would have replaced it for something newer, however he didn't want to. It was a piece of his childhood. He and Noah walked back from the marina to the house, both content to watch the water and not speak. In the house he stemmed his impatience and played with the twins. Ethan kept coming over to him with his book, demanding in toddler gibberish that he read it. He pulled the boy onto his lap and quietly pretended to read, none of the words making sense coming from his mouth, but his nephew didn't seem to mind. Finally, the boys got tired, and Noah with L departed with the twins. Fenley was due to arrive any minute to make supper. He didn't want any. He didn't need any. He grabbed the address book that was in his study and brought it to the kitchen. What he needed was some help to do what he needed to do tonight. He counted out the tabs, knowing that Anne would be under the S's for Schaefer, letter 19 of the alphabet. He remembered writing it in here. Now he needed Fenley to find it for him. He grabbed a piece of paper from the study and a pencil. He stroked out the main lines and began sketching. Soon a face stared back at him. With long lines he put in Anne's hair. He had to erase her eyes and redo them a couple of times. He set down the pencil when Fenley arrived and helped her to bring in the groceries. "'Why you help? I know, old lady.' Fenley still gave him four bags to carry. "'How are you today?' He motioned that he had an okay day. She nodded wisely and pointed to the sketch. You miss Missy Anne. Michael grabbed the sketch and put it beside the address book. He pointed to the pages and the sketch. Please let Fenley understand. What this? She started reading the addresses, then looked at him. What you want? He pointed to both of them again. Find Anne address? Fenley wrinkled her brow. Michael nodded. He grabbed the bundle of flowers that she had purchased to liven up the house. She always brought flowers on Friday for the weekend. He mimed, presenting them to Fan Lee and pointed to the sketch. "'You gonna get her back?' Fan Lee was excited now. "'About time. No other pretty ladies putting up with you.' Michael laughed and pointed to the address book. "'Okay, okay, you bossy!' She perused the book, reading the names out loud until she found Anne's, and he grabbed the highlighter he had taken from the desk in his study. She directed him, and he highlighted the appropriate address. "'How you going to get there?' Fan Lee asked. He thought he'd take a cab. He pulled out his credit card and laid it on the counter. Fen Lee shook her head. No, no cab. You go change. Looks sexy for Anne. I have better idea. He watched as she pulled out her cell phone and chattered away in Vietnamese. There, nephew come. He drive. She shooed him away with her hands. Shower. Look nice. Twenty minute nephew here. Michael grinned and gave the tiny woman a hug. She hugged him back and then shoved him away. Go! He did. He showered, he shaved, he picked out a new suit to wear. He hadn't worn a suit since his last day at Ramsey Pharmaceuticals. He felt strangely nervous as he folded a knot into a tie with practice movements. Tonight meant so much. He was downstairs before the nephew arrived. Fenley looked him over, approving. You handsome man, Mr. Michael. And lucky lady. He smiled his thanks. He hoped this would work. Moments later, Fenley was showing the address to her nephew, who carefully put it in the GPS on his phone. Michael grabbed the bouquet of flowers, and they were off in the nephew's rusty bucket of a car. It was small, and it didn't have the leg room that Michael needed, but he wasn't going to complain. His head touched the ceiling, and he could feel every bump in the road because the shocks were shot. Michael fiddled with his cuffs and tie. The nephew said nothing, and Michael was grateful. He didn't know if the boy could speak English, and Michael didn't want to try to converse. As they got closer to Anne's apartment, Michael's trepidation and anxiety climbed. He tried to concentrate on the city and the people walking. Whatever he thought he might say or do when he had made this plan seemed silly now. This wasn't going to work. He closed his eyes and tried to regroup. He didn't know if it was going to work. It might. He would just wing it and do his best. He wanted Anne back. He wasn't going to get her back if he just sat at home and hoped. 
this was the only thing he could do. After the internal pep talk, Michael felt only marginally better. However, it didn't matter how he felt. They were here. Michael opened the door and folded his body from the passenger seat, taking the flowers. "'Good luck,' Fenley's nephew said in perfect English. Michael looked at him in surprise, then nodded. He approached the lobby and found the daunting row of buttons. Anne was apartment 506. Surely it would be on the fifth row, the sixth one in. He pushed the button. There was no response. He looked at his watch. He hoped he wasn't too late. Michael pressed the button again. What? a cranky old lady said. Not the right button. Michael didn't know what to do. He couldn't press buttons at random, hoping to get Anne. That you, Larry? the voice asked. Michael tried to lie and say yes, but no sound came out. It was like his brain had lost the word on the way to his tongue, and nothing worked. He tried again. Nope. The old lady muttered something about old men losing keys all the time, and the door buzzed and opened. Michael grabbed the door. He tried to say thank you, but that didn't work either. Instead, he made his way to the elevator. Then he rethought that plan. If he went to the wrong floor, he could get lost trying to get back to the right floor. Knowing his luck, he'd count buttons again and end up on the sixth floor rather than the fifth. No. Better to take the stairs and be certain. It took a few minutes to find the stairwell. He'd never taken them in Anne's apartment, always using the elevator before. Five flights of stairs later, he was a little out of breath, and the flowers were looking a little wilted from his slightly panicked grip. He made his way to the elevators, then knew the rest of the way from memory. The numbers on the doors were mixed up. He was fairly certain this was her door. There was only one way to find out. He knocked. There was a rustling on the other side, and Anne swung the door open with a smile. Shock replaced the smile as she saw him. She was beautiful. She had her hair up and a navy curve-hugging dress on. His heart went to his throat, and Michael knew that if he had been able to speak properly, he wouldn't have been able to say anything. He held out the flowers. They were sunflowers and daisies and seemed highly inappropriate for the classy vision before him. She took the bouquet with some confusion. "'Michael, what are you doing here?' He tried to speak. He should have known it wasn't going to happen. He went into her apartment, shutting the door, and took her hands. The flowers were in the way, so he grabbed them and set them to the side table before grabbing her hands again. "'Michael, I can't do this right now. I have a date.' He raised her hands and kissed the back of a hand and laid it over his heart. Surely she understood. Anne closed her eyes. "'I don't understand.' There was a knock on the door. Michael wanted to shout at the man to go away. That's George. I need to go. Look, you can stay here and I'll call you a cab when I get home. Michael pulled her hands out of his, her movements jerky as she grabbed the clutch from the side table. Desperate, Michael grabbed her hand and sank to one knee, begging. Anne looked at him sadly. Michael, I'm not coming back. He watched in disbelief as she opened the door and walked out of his life again. Michael sat slumped on Anne's couch. He felt like the entire world had died around him. He took a deep breath and decided to go home. There was no point in staying. Anne had made her choice. It wasn't him. He locked the door behind him and left the apartment. People walked the streets intent on going where they were going. Traffic was loud. He looked around and a taxi pulled up in front of him. He got in. Where to? Michael opened his mouth to reply, then shut it. He didn't have an address on him for the beach house. He might have a credit card, but he couldn't get home without being able to give directions. Buddy, you okay? Michael gave a short nod and got out of the cab. He would walk. It would be a long walk, but maybe he'd get there before Fenley started breakfast. Did it really matter? He began the long trek. He was going to regret wearing Italian leather loafers. Well, sneakers didn't exactly go with the suit. An hour later, and the loafers were being annoying. The mass of people had thinned out, and he came to a poorer section of town. People were begging for money. He found a discount shoe store and bought a new pair of runners. Outside, he exchanged the footwear, putting the loafers in the shopping bag, easy to carry. 
He was about to get up when a dog came over, sniffing his feet. It was pathetically thin. Michael tried to push it away, however it seemed to think that he was petting at it, and sidled closer. There was a hot dog vendor at the edge of the park nearby. Michael went over and held up two fingers. He pulled out cash, and the man gave him change. Michael laid the two hot dogs on the ground for the dog to eat and walked away. He was perhaps half a block away when the dog caught up to him. Michael tried to shoo it away, but the stubborn canine just kept pace. Finally, he ignored it. At some point, it would get tired and go home. An hour later, the dog was limping beside him. Michael looked at it. It sat, panting and wagging its stump of a tail. It held up a paw, licking at it. Michael sighed and knelt to see what was wrong with the paw. It was hot to the touch, and there was swelling. He could clearly see a sore full of infection. It was surprising the dog had kept pace with him this long. It licked his hand. It wasn't his dog. Ten more minutes of walking, Michael couldn't take it any more. He picked up the dog. It wasn't light. Probably thirty pounds. He grunted and kept walking. Five blocks later, he saw a veterinary clinic that was still open. He walked in and received admonitions about bringing in the dog without a collar or a leash. Michael put down the dog. Then he plunked down his gold credit card. When the lady at the desk realized he couldn't speak, she spoke louder. Michael was unamused. An hour later, they had determined his dog was a boxer and Boston Terrier mixed with something undetermined. She was still puppy and likely to get bigger. She was already spayed. They drained and cleaned the infection, bandaging the paw. After a bath, he could see the brown speckles and the black patches on her short coat as her white areas shined. Her pushed-in nose twitched as shots of antibiotics and vaccinations happened. A collar and a leash were had. Flea and heartworm medication were added to the bill. So was a small bag of dog food. Michael wondered how he was going to carry it all and the dog. Finally, they were finished, and he found he was the proud owner of a dog. He absently petted her as he was handed the vaccination records. With a tight smile, he led the pet out of the building. For another hour, they walked until the dog began to limp again. Sighing, Michael shifted the bags and picked up the dog. She settled her head on his shoulder and let out a gusty sigh as he carried her. He felt like one of those people who was carrying around a package. That's what he should have done, mailed her home. He had a bitter laugh at that, and it started to rain lightly. He decided the dog's name was FedEx because he was carrying her around like a package. She didn't seem to object. Hours later, he was sitting on a bench in the dark with FedEx shivering beside him, pressed against his side. The rain was pouring down, and both of them were soaked. He'd thrown out the loafers. They were one less thing to carry. His feet were sore. So was his back. He petted the dog and debated what he should do. He was maybe halfway to the beach house. It would have been smarter to go to the condo, as it was much closer. However, he hadn't taken his keys when he'd left to try to bring back Anne. Now there was no Anne, but he'd gotten a dog. When he was a child, he'd wanted a dog. His father had unequivocally said no. So there had never been any pets. Well, he was keeping this one. Getting up, he decided there was nothing to do but continue. It was in the early hours of the morning, and nothing was open. He dumped the dog food in the trash to lighten his load. Fenley could buy some. Michael picked up FedEx again. It was hours past sunrise as he trudged up to the house. The rain had stopped. He had blisters on his heels. The front door was unlocked, and Fenley rushed to meet him as he entered. How it go? Missy Ann like? She halted in shock. What happened? He didn't even look at her. He just wanted to have a shower, change into dry clothes, fall into bed, and let despair swallow him whole. He put down the dog, kicked off his shoes, and squelched in his sock feet to his room, dripping water everywhere. FedEx followed. Forget the shower. He'd had six hours of rain poured on him, and he was too tired for it. He showered enough, he decided. He peeled off his clothes and dried himself and the dog with a towel before getting dressed in comfortable sweats. He wished he had some scotch or whiskey in the house. He could down a bottle or two right now. FedEx sighed gustily and watched him with sad brown eyes. It was probably better that he didn't get drunk. He'd never been drunk a day in his life. He didn't know if he'd be a mean drunk or just a sad one. Michael fell across the bed and closed his eyes. Moments later, the bed dipped as FedEx joined him. She sniffed around and curled up next to him with her head on the pillow next to his. 
he didn't even care. The dog was waking him up. It kept nosing his hand around and licking it. Michael jerked back and pretended he was sleeping. He didn't want to get up and face the world yet. FedEx snuffled against his neck and Michael squirmed away. Finally, when she whined, he sat up and ran a hand through his hair. The dog bounded to the door. He got up and let her out. Belatedly, he remembered all the money he put into her and grabbed the leash and collar. He ran after her, blisters protesting. FedEx did her business and came straight back to him, dancing merrily in the sand. Michael sighed and walked back up the deck stairs, the dog following. They made their way to the kitchen. It must be late afternoon. Fenley wasn't there yet, but a bowl of water and some dog kibble had made it into a dish on the floor. FedEx consumed a lot hungrily and slurped up some water. There was a box of colorful bags on the counter. He picked it up. From the pictures he could see that they were scented poop bags for the dog. He was not picking up FedEx's poop. However, if he didn't, it would be all over the beach, and he really didn't want to step in FedEx's poop. He supposed he was picking it up. He had no idea what he was supposed to do with it afterward. He sat down in the box and eyed the dog. Michael wondered how often a dog pooped in a day. FedEx was roaming and sniffing. Michael decided to make coffee and eat some cereal. As he ate, there were two brown eyes watching him mournfully. She was sitting and staring, her head moving with the movement of the spoon. Rolling his eyes, Michael left a little in the bottom of the bowl and fed it to her. She gobbled it up, and he put the empty dish in the sink. He stretched. He was still tired. He decided to head back to bed. FedEx followed him. He decided that she was a good dog already. Noah would hate her. Max would love her. They both settled on the bed, and he reached out a hand, stroking her short, silky fur. He missed Anne. The child yelled gleefully as it came into the bedroom. Michael popped open an eye to see Evan's face right in his toddler breath fanning him. He sighed and sat up, pulling the little boy onto the bed. Immediately, Evan reached out and grabbed FedEx by an ear. The dog pulled her head back and stared at the intruder. Michael hoped that FedEx was okay with kids. She pursed her lips and let out a puff, not quite a bark. Then her head swiveled to look at the door. Expecting to see Ethan next, Michael was surprised to see Elle carrying her other son. She put Ethan carefully on the bed, looking at FedEx. Fen Lee tells me you went to talk to Anne and came home with a dog. She let FedEx sniff her hand and then gently petted her. What happened? He didn't want to talk about it. He focused on Evan instead, encouraging the boy to jump on the bed, something Elle never liked. Obviously, it didn't go well, Elle remarked dryly. No kidding, Michael thought. Not to be left out, Ethan began jumping too. FedEx retreated behind Michael and stared over his shoulder at the two boys. If you don't have anything to say, I'll call Anne and get the story from her, Elle warned mildly. She caught Ethan before he could fall off the bed. Michael didn't feel threatened. Let Elle call Anne. He was surprised she hadn't already done so. It had been a few days since the ill-fated trip to Anne's apartment, and Michael had sulked the entire time, mostly sleeping and taking care of the dog. Fenley had told him he probably needed antidepressants. He didn't see how they would bring Anne back. He figured she was probably just angry at him because he wasn't eating what she cooked and baked. Fenley told me you're not doing so well. L eyed him critically. You look like you could use a shower. A shower, a shave, and new clothes. It had seemed like too much effort, so he hadn't bothered. Now he felt a little grimy and ashamed that L should see him so. He sighed, handing her Evan, and trudged to the closet. FedEx followed him closely, keeping an eye on the intruders. Does the dog have a name? L had followed him too, watching him grab sweats at random. He nodded. I suppose that means you're keeping her, she asked. He looked at FedEx. She had stuck by him. She wasn't going to leave him. Even now she was by his side, looking up at him. He nodded again. Al reached out and gave him a hug. Michael swallowed against the thickness in his throat and hugged her back. I'll leave you to your shower. Come downstairs afterward. Fenley is going to make chocolate chip pancakes. 
Michael had existed on coffee and not much else since the debacle at Anne's apartment. He supposed he should eat something, even if he wasn't hungry. It would make L feel better. Anne had been seeing George Stapleton for a few weeks now. He was a little self-obsessed, but Anne had come to the conclusion that men generally were. He took her to all sorts of functions, and it was obvious he was pleased that she was on his arm. He felt that she made him look good. Anne did her best to be the perfect girlfriend. She was gracious. She maintained a classy image. She deferred to his judgment. In return, he was a perfect gentleman, opening doors, introducing her to his set of friends, paying for their entertainments. He was even a good kisser. Nothing earth-shattering, however, yet not repulsive either. He never pressed further than what she would allow for intimacy, something that she appreciated. He just wasn't Michael. They talked about his home in the city, a lovely historical three-bedroom apartment in a very sought-after neighborhood. They discussed the vacation home he had just purchased in Vermont for skiing. Anne wasn't really a cold-weather sports person. She preferred being warm, but she allowed that she could give it a try. He had gotten her the golf membership at the country club. Her game was improving thanks to the practice she had playing with him. It really shouldn't have come as a surprise when, after dessert during dinner at the club, he got down on one knee, producing a ring that was far too big for Anne's liking. It was garish and large, exuding wealth like George did. George wanted children. Little Stapleton heirs to the Stapleton Empire that he was continuing to build. At least they would have free dental care. Anne felt like a fraud as she smiled and accepted the proposal. Everyone clapped and congratulated them. She should be congratulated. She was getting what she wanted, right? Thank you for listening. If you enjoyed this chapter, please look for the next chapter of Words Unspoken. Also, please click the bell for notifications so that you won't miss any videos. This is free for you and will really help me grow my audience with the algorithms. Thank you.